Lecture 3, Paul's Conversion, and Apostleship, Galatians 1 verses 10-24 By H. A. Ironside For do I now persuade men, or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God, and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by His grace, to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia, and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ, but they had heard only, that he which persecuted us in times past and now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. And they glorified God in me. Verses 10-24 the Apostle Paul in this section is obliged to defend his apostleship. There is something pitiable about that. He had come to these Galatians when they were heathen, when they were idolaters, and had been God's messenger to them. Through him they had been brought to the Lord Jesus Christ. But they had fallen under the influence of false teachers, and now looked down upon the man who had led them to Christ, they despised his ministry and felt they were far better informed than he. This is not the only time in the history of the Church that such things have happened. Often we see young converts happy and radiant in the knowledge of sins forgiven, until under the influence of false teachers they look with contempt upon those who presented the Gospel to them. In the first place, Paul undertakes to show how he became the Apostle to the Gentiles. In verse 10 he says, For do I now persuade men, or God? What does he mean by that? Do I seek the approval of men or of God? Manifestly, of God. The Apostle Paul was not a time server, he was not seeking simply to please men who in a little while would have to stand before God in judgment, if they died in their sins. His express purpose was to do the will of the one who had saved him and commissioned him to preach the gospel of his grace. So he says, I am not attempting to seek the approval of men, but of God. I do not seek to please men, that is, I am not trying to get their approbation. It is true that in another verse he says, Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification, Romans 15 verse 2. But there is no contradiction there. It is right and proper to seek in every way I can to please and help my friend, my neighbor, my brother, but on the other hand, when I attempt to preach the word of God, I am to do it, not as pleasing men but God, which trieth our hearts. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 4 The preacher who speaks with man's approval as his object is untrue to the commission given to him. If I yet pleased men, should not be the servant of Christ. He would simply be making himself the servant of men. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The gospel differs from every human religious system. In some of our universities they study what is called, the science of comparative religions. The study of comparative religions is both very interesting and informative, if you consider, for instance, the great religions of the pagan world such as Buddhism, Brahmanism, Islam. They have much in common, and much in which they stand in contrast one to another. But when you take Christianity and put it in with these religions, you make a mistake, Christianity is not simply a religion, it is a divine revelation. Paul says, I did not get my gospel from men. 
no man communicated it to me. I received it directly from heaven. Of course we do not all get it in this way, as a direct revelation, as Paul did, and yet, in every instance, if a man is brought to understand the truth of the gospel, it is because the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, opens that man's heart and mind and understanding to comprehend the truth. Otherwise he would not receive it. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14, And of course the natural man is not pleased with this divine revelation. Men are pleased when the preacher glosses over their sins, when he makes excuses for their wrongdoings, when he panders to their weaknesses or flatters them as they attempt to work out a righteousness of their own. But when a man preaches the gospel of the grace of God and insists upon man's utterly lost and ruined condition, declares that he is unable to do one thing to save himself, but must be saved through the atoning death of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is nothing about that to please the natural man. It is divine grace that opens the heart to receive that revelation. That was the revelation that came to Paul. There was a time when the Apostle hated Christianity, when he did all in his power to destroy the infant church, and now he says to these Galatians, Ye have heard of my conversation, that is, my behavior, in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God, and wasted it. Twice here he uses the expression, the Jews' religion, verses 13 to 14. The original word simply means Judaism, and is not to be confounded with the word used in the epistle of James, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world, James 1 verse 27. Their religion is used in a proper sense, and we who are saved should be characterized by that, but as the Apostle uses the word here it is something entirely different. The two English words, Jews' religion, are translated from the one Greek word which means, Judaism. Paul hoped through that to save his soul and gain favor with God, until through a divine revelation he had an altogether different conception of things. As long as he believed in Judaism he persecuted the Church of God, and wasted it. One of the pitiable things that has occurred since is that members of the professed Church of God have turned around to persecute the people of Judaism. Strange, this seems, when Jesus says, Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you. Matthew 5 verse 44 Paul hated Christianity. He persecuted Christians and tried to root up Christianity from the earth, and says that he profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. He could say, after the most straightest sect of our religion I lived a Pharisee, Acts 26 verse 5. Judaism was dearer than life to him. He thought it was the only truth, that all men, if they would know God at all, must find him through Judaism. He was exceedingly zealous of the traditions of the fathers, not only of what was written in the Bible, in the law of Moses, what the prophets had declared, but added to that the great body of such traditions as have come down to the Jews of the present day in the Talmud. He would have lived and died an advocate of Judaism if it had not been for the miracle of grace. How did it happen that this Jew who could see nothing good in Christianity turned about and became its greatest exponent? There is no way of accounting for it except through the matchless sovereign grace of God. Something took place in that man's heart and life that changed his entire viewpoint, that made him the protagonist who devoted over thirty years of his life to making Christ known to Jews and Gentiles. He tells us what brought about the change, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by His grace, to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, verses 15 to 16. When the appointed time came, when God in sovereign grace said, as it were, arrest that man, and stopped him on the Damascus turnpike, and when Christ in glory appeared to him, Saul of Tarsus was brought to see that he had been fighting against Israel's Messiah and God's blessed Son. 
then Christ was not only revealed to him, but Christ was revealed in him. We have both the objective and the subjective sides of truth. When I as a poor sinner saw the Lord Jesus suffering, bleeding, dying for me, when I saw that he was, wounded for my transgressions, he was bruised for my iniquities, when I realized that he had been, delivered up for my offenses and raised again for my justification, when I put my heart's trust in him, when I believed that objective truth, then something took place within me subjectively. Christ came to dwell in my very heart. Christ in you, says the Apostle, the hope of glory. It pleased God to reveal His Son not only to me but in me. I was brought to know Him in a richer, fuller way than I could know the dearest earthly friend. It was no longer for Paul a matter of one religion against another. Now he had a divine commission to go forth and make known to other men the Christ who had become so real to him. So when this glorious event took place, when through God's sovereign grace he was brought to know the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, I realized that this glorious understanding was not for me alone but that I might make him known to others, it pleased God to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. When the Lord saved Paul he told him he had that in view. In Acts 9, in the story of the Apostles' conversion, we read that God spoke to Ananias and sent him to see Paul in the street called Straight in Damascus. He did not want to go at first, he was afraid he would be taking his life in his hands, but the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles, and kings, and the children of Israel for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake, Acts 9 verses 15-16. So Ananias went in obedience to the vision and communicated the mind of God to Paul. The Lord had already said, I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people, and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, Acts 26 verses 16 to 17. Preeminently he was the apostle to the Gentiles, but he also had a wonderful ministry for his own people, and all through his life his motto was, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Romans 1 verse 16. Into city after city he went hunting out the synagogues or finding individual Jews or groups, telling them of the great change that had come to him and pleading with them to submit to the same wonderful Saviour. When they rejected his message, he turned to the Gentiles and preached the gospel to them. Some of these Galatians questioned whether he really was an apostle, for he never saw the Lord when he was here on earth, he did not get his commission from the twelve. He says, No, I did not, and I glory in that I am an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ. I received my commission from heaven when I saw the risen Christ in glory and He came to make His abode in my heart. He commissioned me to go out and preach His message. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. They thought He should have gone to Jerusalem to sit down and talk the matter over with the other apostles, and find out whether they endorsed Him and were prepared to ordain Him to the Christian ministry, or something like that. But He says, No, I did not seek anyone out nor confer with any one. My commission was from heaven, to carry it out in dependence upon the living God. So he adds, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia, and returned again unto Damascus, verse 17. He did not go at the beginning to what they considered the headquarters of the Christian church, Jerusalem, to get authorization. Instead of that he seems to have slipped away. In reading Acts we would not know this, but here he indicates that he went into Arabia Petra, and there in some quiet place, perhaps living in a cave, he spent some time waiting on God that he might have things cleared up in his own mind. He wanted time to think things out, time for God to speak to him, and in which he could speak to God. There the truth in all its fullness, its beauty, its glory, opened up to him. It was not there that he had the revelation of the body of Christ. He received that on the Damascus turnpike when the Lord said to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? What a revelation was that of the body that all believers on earth constitute. 
they are so intimately linked with their glorious head in heaven that one member cannot be touched without affecting their head. There was a great deal he needed to understand, and so into the wilderness he went. Have you ever noticed how many of God's beloved servants had their finishing courses in the University of the Wilderness? When God wanted to fit Moses to be the leader of his people he sent him to the wilderness. He had gone through all the Egyptian schools, and thought he was ready to be the deliverer of God's people. When he left the University of Egypt he may have said, Now I am ready to undertake my great life work. But, immediately, he started killing Egyptians and hiding them in the sand, and God says, You are not ready yet, Moses, you need a postgraduate course. He was forty years learning the wisdom of Egypt, and forty years forgetting it and learning the wisdom of God, and finally, when he received his postgraduate degree he was sent of God to deliver his people. Elijah had his time in the wilderness. David had his time there. Oh, those years in the wilderness when hunted by King Saul like a partridge on the mountainside. They were used to help fit him for his great work. And then think of our blessed Lord Himself. He was baptized in the Jordan, presenting Himself there in accordance with the Word of God as the one who was to go to the cross to fulfill all righteousness on behalf of needy sinners, and the Holy Spirit like a dove descended upon Him. He then went into the wilderness for forty days, and prayed and fasted in view of the great ministry upon which He was to enter. Then He passed through that serious temptation of Satan, emerging triumphant, and went forth to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Now here is this man who hated his name, who detested Christianity, but after having had a sight of the risen Christ he goes off into the wilderness for a period of meditation, prayer, and instruction before he commences his great work. Then he says he returned again unto Damascus, and he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. If you read carefully in the book of Acts you will see that it was not until after the conversion of Paul that any one preached Christ as the Son of God. I know the expression, Thy holy child Jesus, is used, but the better rendering is, Servant. Peter preached Jesus as the Messiah, the Servant, but Paul began the testimony that Jesus was in very truth the Son of God. When the Lord Jesus interrogated Peter, Whom say ye that I am? Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16 verses 15-16 But it was not yet God's time to make that known, for the message was limited, in measure, to the people of Israel in the early part of Acts. But when Saul was converted, without fear of man he preached in those very synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God and he himself now was persecuted bitterly by those who once admired him as the leader in their religious practices. Three years went by before this man went to Jerusalem. He went from place to place and finally did go there, but not in order to be ordained or recognized as an apostle. In verse 18 he tells us why he went up, then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and abode with him fifteen days. The word see in the original is very interesting. It is the Greek word from which we get our English word, history. The telling of a story, talking things over, and so Paul says that after three years he went up to Jerusalem to relate his history to Peter, to talk things over with him, to tell him what the Lord had done. What a wonderful meeting that was! It would have been wonderful, unnoticed in a corner of the room, to have heard the conversation. Peter who had known the Lord, who had denied the Lord, who had been so wonderfully restored, who preached with such power on the day of Pentecost and was used so mightily to open the door to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, Peter told his story and Paul told his. And when they got through I imagine Peter would say, Well, Paul, you have the same message I have, but I think the Lord has given you more than he has given to me, and I want to give you the right hand of fellowship. I rejoice in your ministry, and we can go on together proclaiming this glad, glorious gospel. Fifteen Days of Wonderful Fellowship As to the rest of the apostles Paul says, But other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. We are not certain which James he means. He may be the man referred to as James the son of Alphaeus, the cousin of the Lord, who would be spoken of as his brother. 
My personal opinion is that he is the James who occupies so large a place in the book of Acts, James who was the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, who did not believe while the Saviour was here on earth, but was brought to believe in him in resurrection, and who led the Church of God in Jerusalem. Paul saw him, but from none of them did he get any special endorsement or authorization. He met them on common ground. They were apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, so was he, by divine appointment. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Strange that he should have to say this. Strange that these Galatians, his own converts, should think for a moment that he might be untruthful. But when one gets under the power of false teaching, as a rule he is ready to make all kinds of charges as to the integrity, the honesty of other people. And so it is here, and the Apostle has to say, the things that I am telling you are true. I am not lying. After returning from Jerusalem he launched out on his great missionary program. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. He had been known among other assemblies in Judaism, Jewish assemblies knew him well, but Christians in Judea, believers who had separated from Judaism, had never seen him. But they had heard only, that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. And what power there was in that! Here was the man who had gone to all lengths to turn a man away from Christ, even attempted to compel him to blaspheme, threatened him with death if he would not repudiate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this great change has come, and word is going through the churches, the great persecutor has become an evangelist, he is no longer our enemy, but is preaching to others the same faith that means so much to us. And they glorified God in me. Truly, Paul's conversion was a divine, sovereign work of grace, and praise and glory redounded to the one who had chosen, commissioned, and sent him forth. The abundant resultant fruit was to his glory. Nothing gives such power to the ministry of Christ as genuine conversion. I do not understand how any man can presume to be a minister who does not know the reality of a personal conversion and the truth of the gospel. That gospel has lost none of its power. It can work just as wonderful miracles today for men who will put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you trusted Him? Have you believed in Him? Is He your Savior? Do you know what it means to be converted? Can you say, Thank God, my soul is saved, God has revealed His Son in me?